Now let me ask you real quickly tonight, where are you mentally in your own mind? These are just some of the scriptures in the Bible that have to do with your mind. And we're talking about your emotional, mental, your will, your dreams, your hopes, your desires. Um, the Bible is real clear about women, silly women, uh, godly women, young women, old women. <laughs> you know, I'm in that category. And it's just all of that, how we're to think, how we're to act. Mark chapter 5, verse 15, number 1. Have a right mind. Everybody say, I have a right mind. And then Jesus came along, talked about in the book of Luke, that someone could have a doubtful mind. They have trouble believing. We are to believe the word, Acts 17, 11 says, with all readiness of mind. Living with all humility of mind. Romans 1, 28 says that when people ignore the wisdom and order of God, they turn into and have a reprobate mind. The mind of the flesh, Romans 8, talks about how the mind of the flesh, the mind of the flesh is sense and reason, the Amplified says, without the Holy Ghost. Isn't that something? The carnal mind, a fleshly mind, is that you try to figure it out without the Holy Ghost out of your mind. And then the mind of the Spirit and the mind of the Lord are all mentioned in Romans 8 there. A renewed mind. How many of you want that? Man, we do, don't we? We want a renewed mind. Then number nine says, being of the same mind or of one mind. That's how we're to function together in the body of Christ. Is that we just pray that we get in one mind. You know, and sometimes I just do it because I know everybody else wants to do it and that's okay. It may not have been just exactly the color of floor or something I wanted, but we're going to do it by God. We're going to believe God and have it by faith and we're going to walk on that thing and shout the praises of God. It wasn't exactly the color I wanted, but who gives a rip? I'm going to get to walk on streets of gold one day. Just keep it all in perspective. A fervent mind, a willing mind, having a renewed mind in the spirit of your mind. Now, that's what the verse I quoted to you earlier in Ephesians 4, that you are to be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. You know, if you stay home all day long and think about your problems, you don't even need the devil to oppress you. You did a good job of it yourself. Isn't that right? Heck, we don't even need the devil. I can do that all by myself. Just leave me alone in a closed room for about two hours and I'm there. But if I preach to myself the Word of God and I begin to get a fresh mind about it, get a good night's sleep, <laughs> you know, whatever you have to do, you know, I mean, I, I just whatever you have to do to just get yourself to where you're not thinking stupid stuff anymore and you're not thinking out of your goofy head and, you're, and you've actually come up with, yo, a spiritual thought from the Word of God. <laughs> what, a, what a shock that, the, that a woman would actually dig herself out of the pit and actually come up with, hey, I need to believe that scripture. Pastor preached on it Sunday. I said amen to it. What the heck? <laughs> you know, why am I not... Acting like this is true in my life when I'm having a pity party this morning when I just heard that scripture. What am I doing? I need to renew my mind. I need to start walking this floor and saying what the word of God says. And I need to program that mind. Holy Spirit, you will help me. You're the one that teaches me, that's called alongside to help me and show me how to do this so that it will practically fit into my life and I can actually be a doer of the word. And God will help you do that. Now... Number 13, these verses are very revelatory. There are enemies of your mind. You'll need to learn about that. 2 Thessalonians 2 said that Paul said that he would not want you soon shaken in mind. Psalm 112 says, My heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord, even when I hear evil tidings. I will not fear for evil tidings, for my heart is fixed, I'm trusting in in the Lord. Everybody say, my heart is fixed. Now that's that inside unseen part of you Dean always talked about. That's the spirit of your mind. That spirit and soul are going to go to heaven. You're going to leave your body here and get a new one. But the spirit and soul always is going to be together, wherever they go. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your memories, your personality, it's all going to stick together. And you're going to spend eternity somewhere. Everybody is. So God doesn't want you soon shaken in your mind. 
And then the last one, it says, y'all be familiar with this, to gird up, Peter said. You know, thank God for Peter. If, you know, there are just some things that Peter said in, in his books that if Peter hadn't said them, I wouldn't believe them. Just because of his personality. Just because of his big mouth, arrogant, egotistical, you know, rush in where angels fear to trod, personality. And if he said it, then I'm going, well, then golly, I'm, you know, Peter can work this out. Then hopefully this will, there's some hope for me. Because if you're a kind of a loud mouthy woman, I don't know anyone like that. <laughs> but <laughs> then there's hope. There's hope that Jesus will and really make a difference in my personality. Your attitude, how many of you know, determines your altitude. The way we set our minds. Dean always taught our church. He said, the real enemy to God, to the gospel in any area of the, of the world is not the devil. It's the mindset of the community. It's how people think in that local area which determines what God can do. Jesus couldn't do any mighty works in his own hometown because they didn't believe he was who he said he was. They had an attitude about it. Isn't that right? That's why it's so important that you change the mindset by the preaching of the gospel and the living of the saints in front of them as a testimony to change the mindset of the community to go with, the, with God. God's not trying to change everybody's lifestyle. If he can start changing you in your mind and your attitude, then you'll take authority over it and start changing your life where you need to because that's only between you and the Lord. That's nobody else's business. But look at that. I mean, to me, that's just amazing that it's our associations with others, where we go to relax, what we read, hear and accept as faith, will determine the atmosphere of our mind. What we read and believe, who we associate with, and where we go to relax, it's just Psalm 1. You know, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. It's where you go to relax and who you believe and what you read and watch. That's going to determine the atmosphere of your mind. Check on yourself. <laughs> Pay attention to speaking into your life even with places where you relax. Psalm 1-1 is proof positive that you can change the credibility and integrity of your faith life by changing and inspecting those three things in your life. Being a positive woman is work. It requires discipline in your thoughts and words. Um, has anybody in this room ever complained? Has anybody in this room ever criticized? Has anybody in this room ever found yourself or anybody in your family or friends told you you're complaining too much? You're criticized. Why are you always so critical? Now, we laughed, but we didn't admit guilt. <laughs> but uh, criticizing and complaining is just real easy to do, especially, Adam, that's what happened to Eve. That's how the enemy was able to get to her because he pointed out a problem. And it's so, pointing out the problem is the easy part. It's coming up with a solution that takes integrity. If you're, it's, you know, politicians are famous for blah, blah, blah is wrong, but they never tell you what they're gonna do to change it really, and few of them ever do. So there has to be a level of integrity among the church that we actually can do this by changing the mindset of our own lives. And how this will be done is one-on-one, -on -one, just me, you, each of us changing all of these things that we're talking about tonight. Criticism and complaining is a habit. And if you're just downcast all the time, or you're always complaining, and I just think in America there's a real stronghold of just a spirit of dissatisfaction. People are looking for love in all the wrong places and everybody's counting on somebody else to make them happy. And you and I have got to be in a place to where we're happy because happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And that if, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. <laughs> it was grace that brought me safe thus far. It'll be grace that'll lead me on. And all my dreams, hopes, thoughts, and desires, Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ask or think, but it is according to the power that is at work within me. That yes, that's true. <laughs> the verse above that is the kicker. People quote that verse and they say, oh, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. Let's just all tiptoe through the roses because it's coming down the street today. 
But that's not what, we pull that out of context and we don't look at what's above it. What's above it, Paul says, I'm praying that I might become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself, that I might be filled to the, with the richest measure of the divine presence so that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever ask, hope, thought, dream, or desire according to the power that is at work on the inside of me. Unto him be glory in the church, by the way. <laughs> now see, that's, that's, how he, that's how God sees a big picture. Paul said that to us. I want to become a body, wholly filled and flooded with God himself, so that I might be filled with the richest measure of the divine presence of God. I don't just have a little bit of Holy Ghost. You know, some people decide they just want Easter Sunday and Christmas, and they'll call the church to have them pray when they're in trouble, but whoa, that's all I want. Everybody's picked their water line. Churches, once a week's not enough for me. That's all I need. Or just this or that. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't need Bible study. I don't need this. You know, I'll just come to church. Pastor will teach me and I'll go home and I'll, that'll be the end of it. And I'll just go on with my life. Well, that's not how God intends for it to be. He intends for us to be in a place to where we're constantly being renewed in the spirit of our mind with a fresh mental and spiritual attitude, we put off the old man, put on the new man, and we begin to walk in the glory of God so that I become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself, that I am filled with the richest measure of the divine presence so that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or think because it's according to the power I've generated on the inside of me to actually be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word of God. So that we're fooling ourselves if we're looking at a promise from God and yet we're not working to work with God from the inner man. This is not works in the flesh. This is works in the spirit. This is working with God, co-laborers with God. Like the Colossians 2, that God works on the inside. He is all the while at work. Everybody say, God's always working. Now just look down here. How does that look? God is all the while at work in me, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now, it's not in my own strength, but in his power. And he just keeps telling me these things so that he, I'm aware of what's going on on the inside. I don't know what that looks like, but I know he's in there working. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Christ in me, the hope of God's glory manifesting in and through my life. And see, when we can begin to take scriptures that actually we've read, but we haven't yet quite learned how to receive them, we haven't quite learned how to incorporate them into our daily life. See, that's the Lord calling. He's saying I'm doing good. <laughs> this is Jesus. He's just saying, go on, Renee, tell him some more. All right, now look at this. I want to show you this real quickly. Psalm 9.9, if you've not read that scripture, this is one of the most powerful scriptures you can renew your mind to. It says that the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower in the time of high cost, destitution, and desperation. Isn't that a great scripture? The name of the Lord is a strong tower in the time of high cost, destitution, and desperation. If you're, in a, if you're facing a time of high cost, you don't have the money, destitution and desperation and actually just in the amplified it says the Lord also will be a refuge and a high tower for the oppressed that means that the devil's just come to clean your plow you're facing impossible situations and your mind can't see any way out that the Lord will be a refuge in the times of trouble high cost destitution and desperation if a God can find somebody that will actually believe that, say it, and live by it, God will show himself strong. Smith Wigglesworth said many, many decades ago, he said God will step over a thousand people to act on behalf of the person that's believing him. I mean, God says, there's one. <laughs> I'm going to go over there and work with them. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro, looking for an opportunity to show himself strong. Now, this next, these next scriptures are really important for you. I would encourage all of the women of this church, just like I would anywhere and did the women at Lakewood Church the other night. The New Testament describes all kinds of women. Which one do you want to be? 
How do we want to live our days here on this planet? It talks about silly women. Now, this is some of the most powerful stuff. And, I, and you know, I don't hear a lot of men preaching this because they know they're going to get tomatoes thrown at them. But, um, so I'm a woman, so I'm going to alert you to this because this is the spirit of our age. Silly women. Oh, my God. And it doesn't matter how old they are. I mean, young, old, I mean, it's just silly, silly stuff. But look at this. It talks about in 2 Timothy 3, and it's describing the hard times, this, the perilous times. Anybody can tell we live in perilous times? When they're going to drag our ambassador through the streets and do the despicable things they did to that man before they, he was murdered. The ungodly, horrible, demonic things that they did to that poor man before he died. And we're living in days when Christians are the target. I had to, I'm going to sign a paper on Tuesday to help a young Persian young man stay in this country for asylum because his life has been threatened if he returns back to his homeland. That the Christians are being martyred. There are more martyrs now in the last 110 years than there have been Christian martyrs in the last 110 years than there have been all other years put together. More martyrs for the sake of Jesus Christ in the last 110 years. We live in times of high cost, destitution, and desperation for many people. Some may be lazy, but some are really in trouble. This verse right here d indicates the time that we live in, times that are hard to deal with and hard to bear. And I, I always remind people, it doesn't say here in the, in the Word of God that it's because of the oil prices or the global warming <laughs> or the ozone layer. I saw where all the global warming scientists were reprimanded the other day by an international council, and I thought, oh, good. <laughs> because God's attitude about this planet is it's going to work for us till we get out of here. There's going to be enough stuff here for us to enjoy until the church gets out of here. Once the church is gone, they're on their own. They can save, they can, they can save the whales. They can play with, you know, you know, they can do whatever they want to do, hug a tree, kiss a rock. But while I'm here, I'm using this stuff. How about you? <laughs> God made it. He said, rise, kill, and eat. By God, we're killing them. <laughs> and they wore those skins. So help yourself, ladies. <laughs> you know, my attitude, I'm always, I never vote for, a, I haven't voted for a personality in many decades. I always vote for principle and platform. I check out the one that is the closest to the word of God, and it doesn't matter what the name of the party is, I'm just going to go with it. Because I know eventually they'll hold that person to some level of accountability somewhere. Somebody will say something that, hey, this isn't right, you know? And yet when it comes to some of these crazy things that are out there, perilous times, hard to deal with, hard to bear. I mean, the abortion issue. I mean, you know, it's not hard if you're a believer, uh, you know, because God says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, so choose life. Hello? <laughs> you know, so we're going to choose life. And I understand terrible situations happen in life. But you know what? I had, we had a member of our family that something like that happened to. And I mean, I saw God do supernatural things. And I saw the Lord help. If people don't have a God, I understand what they have to do. But see, it's not, I tell, I tell people all the time, it's not, it's G, capital G-O-D, not G dot G-O-V. <laughs> so that we're not dependent on the church. We're not dependent on an insurance policy. We're not, we're not depending on other circumstances or entities. And thank God the Lord uses people to help. Isn't that right? And thank God we live in a country that has compassion on people and wants to help and has a desire to help. What I don't appreciate is somebody using somebody else's crisis to milk it for their advantage. And that's what's wrong. And so you and I stand as the bastion of hold the phone. It's not going to go this far. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're going to do it God's way. Let God be true, the Bible says, and every man a liar. Now, is anybody bold enough to say that to anybody that is lying? <laughs> and it has to be some of us that are standing up and say, now, you know, we love the Lord, we love you, we're not, we're not trying to be ugly here and rude, but we just have to tell you, that's not the wisdom of God. We don't even have to quote another script, any scriptures, we just have to say, we're going to deal with this from a standpoint of accountability, and this is the pool we're dipping into to get our wisdom. <laughs> this, is, this is God's 
concept of this thing, and we're going to figure out a way to help everybody. Now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy whole house. Now do we believe that? Yes. And are we going to live that way? And are we going to stand up and say something about it? And if, we're, and if we're tottering on issues and things that we don't understand, then it's our responsibility to not just go downhill with the rest of the fish, but to find out what we believe and stand up and say, this is what God says. Here's the mirror, folks. James chapter 1. Here's the mirror. This is what we're looking at. This is how we're going to gauge our lives. Amen? Now, I want to show you this silly women in these high times that are hard to deal with and times that are hard to bear. People will be, does it, see if you know anybody like this, or peradventure, you might have trouble in this area, not in the church, I'm assuming. Nobody, everybody here is perfect. Will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered. Do you know anyone like that? Have you on occasion been utterly self-centered? Lovers of money aroused by an inordinate greedy desire for wealth. You know, there's nothing wrong with making profit off of a good business taking it home and enjoying it. I mean, you worked for it. You had it. It's your money. You do with it what you want to. Let's see now, in June, in July, we actually started working for money that was ours. The first six months of the year, we worked for the government. <laughs> Starting in July, it's all ours. Take home pay. <laughs> it says they are proud, arrogant, and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents. <laughs> That's a good one ungrateful, unholy, and unprofane. Do you know anybody that's ungrateful? Some, well, some, it's usually somebody that's criticizing and complaining and they add ungrateful to that. That's what criticizing and complaining comes into because it's, it, it, criticism and complaining equals ungrateful. You're not, you're not thankful for anything that you've gotten. They will be un, without natural human affections, callous and inhuman, relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled, fierce, haters of good. And if, if there is good in the earth, who possesses that? The people of God. That means if they're going to hate good, they're going to end up hating one of you. So you just need to be prepared and have the armor of the Lord on. And then it says... Um, they will be treacherous, betrayers, rash, inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. Now that's the spirit of the world. Now let's look down here. For although they hold a form of godliness or piety, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct, I like this phrase, Jody, their conduct belies the genuineness of their faith. Now we need to face up to some of this, all of us. Does our conduct belie the genuineness of what we say our faith is? For among them, like here's where you pay attention, ladies. Among them are those who worm their way into homes and captivate silly and weak-natured and spiritually dwarfed women loaded down with the burden of their sins and easily swayed and led away by various evil desires and seductive impulses. This is the kicker. These weak women will listen to anybody who will basically talk to them. Now, I don't want to be that gullible. Eve was that gullible. There's a curse on women in the earth that we're just gullible if people talk to us and we believe things. But an informed woman, somebody full of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to end up being a silly, weak-natured, spiritually dwarfed woman who will be influenced by anybody that can sweet-talk them into doing anything, believing anything, justifying their actions. The spirit of the harlot there in Proverbs chapter 7, it says, with her, much in, with her much justifying and enticing arguments, she leads him astray to, to ignore his conscience, and she takes him captive. That's the spirit of the world. And you and I don't want to have that in our own heart, much less live around it and think that we would go to a church full of people that had a bunch of silly women in them. People that, women that just let anybody talk to them, anybody influence them. And you know how that happens is because you don't have confidence in who you are in Christ Jesus, that you're insecure, you're, you feel inferior, I'm not good enough, let somebody else pray. Call sister so-and-so, she knows how to pray. 
get all the women together because I'm just going through a hard time. Well, those are the kind of women that get led astray by the first person that shows them compassion. And a lot of our young people in the world have gotten taken captive because they got celebrated by the wrong kind of people. And that's why you and I can't be those kind of women. Um, as I close here tonight, I want you to see this, that being, oh, there's so many great things in here about happy women, not gossipers, women that lead and train the younger. And of course, women that pray and excel in hospitality are all described in the Word of God. Lydia was a businesswoman whose heart the Lord opened. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? How many want the Lord to open your heart to hear what the Word of God has to say? I mean, Lydia was a businesswoman whose heart, it describes her, the Lord opened. I would love to have that said about me. Renee Garner, whose heart the Lord opened. What an accolade to, to think that God could open my heart and I would let him and I would act on it and do what Lydia did. And then being positive is a direct result of an unshakable confidence. You're not going to get deceived by anybody that talks to you on TV or at church or out in the marketplace or among your family members or at a weak moment that you're going to get sucked into some level of, of seduction and deception. You're going to end up being able to stand up and say, wait a minute, I know who I am. I am not a silly, weak-natured, spiritually dwarfed woman who is easily led astray. I have the mind of Christ. I am full of the Holy Spirit. I have the God kind of faith. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Hell fears my presence. <laughs> you know? I mean, you begin to, if you talk to yourself like this, then you have, you can begin to build on, your in, on the inside of you an unshakable confidence, not just in who you are, but whose you are, and the God that we serve. And this is coming down to the fact that we can't just preach the gospel anymore. Hey, y'all, we're actually going to have to live it. We've got to actually do this stuff. What a concept that God would actually want us to do this in these last days. And it says, we've got to build it. In, I wrote here that we've got to build it in our mind into our soul by giving our mind regular positive affirmation from the Word of God, from a believable and proven source. That's how we build confidence, that we have a believable source, we have a trusted source, and we begin to build on that. God's purpose for choosing to live in us. Think what, a, what an idea. God said, no, I'm going to go live in them. I'm not just going to make them all come to one building. I'm going to go live in them so that they are autonomous with my presence. They can go anywhere in the world and be totally equipped to do what I've asked them to do. You're not codependent on a church or a pastor when it comes to that. You're not codependent on anybody because you can go all by yourself anywhere and have all power, all authority in the name of Jesus. And you, can, and you can use in the name of Jesus. You can take the word of God. You can say it out of your mouth. And the crocodiles in India will obey you if you need them to. I mean, you can take authority. When you get on the plane, I've, always, I've said for decades now, when I get there, God gets there. When I get on the plane, God gets on the plane. When I go to H-E-B, God goes to H-E-B. But I've had to renew my mind to this. I've had to say it every day till I believed it. And you all know that because that's, you know, a lot of you have been taught this way. Um, and look at these last three scriptures here. Let's, say, let's all say C together. Let's read it together. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Number two, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And since we positively know that he hears us, then we know that we have desired of him as our present possessions. Now, if that's not a promise, I don't know what is. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 35, and 36. Then number three. Nay, amid all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. A positive and confident woman has read the Word of God. Dean always preached that there are three relationships you're to have with the Word of God. You read it, you study it, and then you meditate it. And you go back and you read it, and you study it, and you meditate it. You go back again and you read it and you study it, and you meditate it. That's how a human mind relates to the Word of God. And then confidence is built from information and association. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. <laughs> Say positive words, and it will be easier to daily live positive in a very negative world. And God just expects you to open your mouth and say something. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, it says about Hannah, after she'd been tormented by her sister, 
and told you, you know, you don't have any babies. I'm the one that can have the babies, you know. And, and uh, she was always out there all by herself. She couldn't have a baby. And she ended up, uh, it was the, his other wife, not her sister. And she, by, she was out there all by herself, lonely, went to the Lord, ended up being pregnant. A year later, had Samuel. And she went back to dedicate him to the Lord. And she says something so amazing. When she went in to dedicate Samuel to the Lord and she began to make that offering and offer that offering of thanksgiving to the Lord, guess what she said? Now is my mouth open wide against my enemies. Because <laughs> look what the Lord has done for me. You know? I mean, it's an amazing thing that she acknowledged, even under the Old Covenant, now is my mouth open wide. And it was open wide in praise and thanksgiving and confidence that God did it for her. And that's how the Lord wants us to live. And as I said tonight early, I mean, I'm preaching to me. <laughs> I'm living this stuff. I've got to have it. I've got to have a positive attitude and a very heartbreaking negative situation in my life. And my kids and our grandkids and we're, you know, there's, there's pain and there's sorrow and separation and death is awfully final. <laughs> it's just, it's just there. And you can't fix it. You can't pray about it. It's over. It's done. There's nothing left to say about it. You, you can't use your faith and change it. It's there. It's, you're going to live with it. And there's a way to live with it. <laughs> there's a way to overcome the torment. There's a way to move to the next thing that God has, regardless of how it, painful it may look. And I know... I've seen God do it too many times in other areas of my life. I know this is no step for a stepper. That he will show me how to do this. And, I, and like I said, I haven't done it perfectly. Uh, you know, I'm a, a human being just like everybody else is. Um, you know, I've got hopes and dreams and desires and things I want to go do and things I'd like to see happen in my life. But on the other hand, I know God's way is perfect. And I don't want to try to fix it myself. I want the Lord to fix it. And uh, his time doesn't always seem to go with my clock. How about y'all? <laughs> you know, our days and our times are in his hand. And I, I've, I've worked this stuff enough to know that it works. A lot of you have the same testimony. How many of you proven, tested the Lord and proven him and saw his works and saw him provide and do what he said he would do? That he is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he says something, he'll do it. If he's spoken it, he'll make it good. And man, when my head doesn't believe that, that's when I have to say it the most. <laughs> when I'm struggling with how I feel, and that seems to be the loudest voice rather than what I believe, then that's when I need to preach to me the strongest. When the chips are down is how you'll prove where you're really willing to invest the time to bring you to a place of walking by faith. And if you don't feel like you have it at the time, call one of these ladies here in the church and say, tell me what I believe. <laughs> tell me one more time what I believe because I'm really struggling with this. I know I believe it, just it doesn't feel like I believe it. Anybody ever been there? You don't feel like you believe it. But that's what church is all about. That's the genius of the body of Christ that he gave us the church in the last 2,000 years so that we're not like Old Testament saints and Old Testament prophets, just one man here and one group here. There's the body of Christ, the genius of the church. <laughs> and we get to have church not in Tulsa, not just in Houston, but in every community. Isn't that wonderful? I love churches. I don't care where they are. I've been in churches all over the world and all kinds of different places. I've been in pig pens and horse corrals and chicken huts and lean-tos and, and uh, five-star hotels, and we've had church in all of them. And it's been marvelous to see God just shows up anywhere. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He just shows up. If you show up, he'll be there. If you call, he answers. You know? If you draw near, he draws near. And he doesn't care where you draw near at. It may be riding on a horse or it may be out there driving in a limousine at, you know, drinking it up, think it miserable, and cry out, God, help me. Oh, the mercy of our God who will come when somebody calls and says, help me. Help comes from the Lord. Now, I want to encourage you, Pam, and all of you ladies here, Gracie, that you all hang together. You don't get in each other's business too much. Stay out of everybody's life. <laughs> don't criticize, don't complain or judge. Be grateful, be happy, 
show mercy, work together. Paul said, encourage Yodius and Sintichi. They were two women. He said, encourage them to work together. Evidently hadn't been doing such a good job. <laughs> but there was a little strife there, a little contention, you know, maybe a, you know, a little competition about things. He said, but encourage Yodia and Sintichi. I'm so glad my mother didn't name me one of those names. <laughs> but I mean, just God's attitude is help the women not be led by their emotions and their feelings and the heartache and the loss and the abuse, of maybe from men or from circumstances or the abandonment and loss in life, widows, children, you know, all of these things that can happen to us. Do you know that there are over 28 million people today that are in human slavery on the planet right now? 28 million. The, the largest organization for human trafficking was just at Lakewood a few months ago uh, during the summer, and they said over 28 million that they know of on the planet are in human bondage, human trafficking, slavery right now more than there has ever been on the planet before all put together. And that's in the bastion of the 21st century luxury opulence of the preaching of the gospel all over the world. Lisa Bevere said something uh, about three years ago. She put on her website, she said, I'm going to prove something here. I'm going to find out where the church is. She put on her, on her, on her website that she wanted some input from everybody that's on, uh, in her, that c checks out her website. And she put this out there. She said, they have proven statistics that over 5 million a year, 5, women, five million women a year disappear off the planet, gone. They don't know where they are, murdered, kidnapped, whatever they're done. Five million women a year are taken off the planet and nobody knows where they are. She said she got less than 20 responses. Handful of responses. She said, several days later, she said, I'm going to prove where everybody is. She put a statement out there and said, I've been criticized for preaching on the platform in sleeveless dresses. And she said, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but she said, I, you know, places I go and preach, it's hot, and, you know, I'm out in, you know, open air places or something, and I'm, I'm in a place and I have on a sleeveless dress. And I've been criticized for preaching on the platform in a sleeveless dress. What do you think about it? Over 600 responses to that kind of stupidity. I mean, I don't care if she preaches in a Casper ghost costume. <laughs> I don't care if Kermit the Frog comes out there and preaches. Just give me the truth. How about y'all? But when the church ignores five million women off the planet and wants to talk more about how the preacher's wife's dress, we're screwed up. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I mean, that's pretty much where we are. I mean, we are definitely messed up. If we're more concerned about how the preacher's wife looks, then we ought to be so angry and full of outrage. Bill Bennett wrote a great book called The Death of Outrage, and I think everybody in the church ought to read it. Because when you're not outraged anymore by things like that, we've grown dull of hearing. I'm so dang mad about all of that. I'm mad at me. I'm not mad at anybody else. I'm just mad at me because I've been sidetracked and dealing with, you know, and I know the enemy came against Dean and I in a lot of ways, um, you know, just in, the, in a situation with us because it sidetracked us from the prayer and the focus that we had where we had to deal with the sickness and we had to deal with the hurt and the doctors rather than dealing with the ministry. And you know, don't let the devil take you out. <laughs> don't let the devil sidetrack you. Don't let sickness, those tapes that I told you about, T.L. Osborne on healing the sick, sickness steals from everybody. It steals not just your money and your time, but it steals your youth and it steals your focus and it steals your ministry and it steals so many things that you would have done if you'd have been healthy and working for the Lord. And I just implore the church that we're not, that we've got to be outraged <laughs> when the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy from any of us. And that we rise up together in a corporate voice and begin to stand in the gap in intercessory prayer and we don't let the devil take any of us out. And we don't get distracted with me, my, I, and I needs and I'm believing for a new job and I'm believing for a husband and I'm believing that this will come in. And we just have all this foolishness that we're using our faith for when we ought to, if we'll cast that care over on the Lord and realize that we're blessed already <laughs> and God will take care of us when we're about His business. 
and his business is the saving of souls on this planet. And at least we can be concerned about other women and be concerned that God would do something that my prayers, if I'm woken up at 1 o'clock in the night, can save some woman from being kidnapped in human trafficking. And I can have some prayer that will have an effect on a little child being molested in some country of the world. Jesus, just use my tongue to minister on behalf of the lost and the hurting. Proverbs 31, I woke up thinking about this verse this morning. About It says, it's not for Lemuel, O king. O Le it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to desire strong drink and pervert any of the justice do the poor. The church should be showing the world how to have compassion on the hurting and the downcast and the desperate and those that are in chains and in bondage and those that are out there being tormented and molested and abused by the world. There should be an outrage that the church stands up, no more. We take charge. It's what we say that's going to come to pass. And I don't, there's no government in the world that can, that can eradicate poverty. <laughs> I know it's a bunch of rock bands got together to eradicate poverty. Well, you're going against what Jesus said because he said you're going to have the poor with you always. So everybody just get used to it. People are going to screw up. They're not going to know how to come out of darkness. It's a spirit. And no, no goofy, stupid band is going to be able to stop that spirit. <laughs> I don't care how many of them you get up on a stage. They're no match for the spirit of poverty. You can dump all kinds of money into the poor and they'll just abuse it. They'll just use it for all kinds of stuff. And even if there's hurting people, we send money all the time and goods all the time to countries of the world and it sits on the wharfs where they came in on the ship and rots because the government officials won't let it go and they get extract money and taxes from people trying to get the money and let, they would rather let it sit on the wharfs and rot than give it to their people. That's happened in Ethiopia to our friends of ours over and over and over again that have huge organizations that go in to try to help those people in southern Ethiopia. And that's just one place that we know in Africa. It's just, it's just prevalent everywhere. But it's the church. We're the ones that are the salt of the earth. We're the ones that are the light of the world. We're the ones that are supposed to be the city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And you've got to see it for yourself that that's me. That's not just us. That's me. And say those things about yourself and confess those things about yourself and begin to build confidence in you that it's your prayers that are making a difference in every situation that you're involved in. Let's bow our heads tonight. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that your word gives us something halfway decent to say. Lord, that you're, it's your word that changes our perspective, that causes our hearts and our souls to be repentant and soft and tender and correctable. And Father, it expands our minds to think higher and to expect more from the Lord that regardless of our emotional state and regardless of how we all feel, Lord, where we've come from, what we've experienced in life and what we hope to have in the future, Lord, that you're going to be the one that's going to change all that and help us and achieve the things that you want us to have. I pray over this great church, Lord, that the blessing of the Lord settles upon them in such a mighty way that they see the miraculous like they've never seen it before. They have a harvest of souls over the next several weeks like they've never seen before, that you impart strength and wisdom and Holy Ghost anointing and power to manifest through the members of this congregation. Lord, that the, that the power of God rest upon them to not just be hearers of the word and love one another, Lord, to be, be actual doers of the word and see the fruit of their prayers. I pray an anointing of strength on the leadership of this church and a great, great, atmosphere of peace and joy and harvest and Lord just like in Acts chapter 2 that everybody's blessed everybody's seeing the blessing of God and that they stand shoulder to shoulder like Paul said in fitly array ready to do the word of God and people will hear of their love and their faith I pray over them tonight great harvest and great bounty in each of these women's lives and the families they represent the ones that couldn't be here tonight Lord you make sure by the Holy Spirit, that they all are stirred by the power of your strength and by the word that you have given to us in promise. I pray a harvest over the word of God. It will not return void. We're in agreement with what you say. And we give you all the glory tonight for the, in the mighty name of Jesus for what you're doing in each of our lives. We're all trophies to your grace and to your glory. 
Thank you for it, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. All right, Gracie, Hallelujah. Whoever's in charge here, anybody need to do something, say something?